I really have lost the fear of dying. And I also feel that by writing down my father's words, I entered into the portal with him. And I feel like my life has been very much more spiritual and sacred in the years after his death, because I feel like by writing down his words and really being with him in a really profound way um, in, his, in his final days, I've, I've entered into, uh, into an altered and sacred state. And I do feel like the portal is a sacred place, just like it is when people give birth. Namaste. You're listening to the Savana Podcast. Join us on an exploration of Eastern spirituality, yoga philosophy, and conscious living for the new age. This podcast is a production of SavanaSpirit.com, where you can find a large selection of Om and yoga clothing, spiritual jewelry, and unique fair trade gifts from the Far East. Now here's your host, Ashton Subbo. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Savannah Podcast. We've got a great show in store for you today, but I want to remind you, head on over to savannahspirit.com slash contest. Enter in this week for the weekly prize, which is a $100 gift card to savannahspirit.com. You can enter in each and every week. It's not a one and done. Keep going back each week. You'll get drawn in the contest again to win. So it's pretty exciting. It's a big thank you for listening. Our show today is all about what we learn towards those moments of death. As we're approaching the the final stage, what are people communicating? What are they saying? What can we learn from this experience? Our guest today is Lisa Smart. She's a linguist, educator, and poet who founded the Final Words Project and recently wrote the book Words at the Threshold, What We Say As We're Nearing Death. Lisa, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. So I'm fascinated by your work because it's a, it's a time of life that I'm very interested in, but my interest has always been what's happening in the brain and what's going on with consciousness and all these kind of more technical sides. Not your work is technical as well, but it, you're, you're trained as a linguist. So the, the approach of looking at it from language, I found absolutely fascinating. T- tell us a little bit about your your background and what led you to get involved in, and start the Final Words Project and then ultimately write this book. Uh, great. Well, I do have a background in language, and I think part of what I love about language is it does track how we think, who we are. And uh, I originally studied the difference at Berkeley, the difference between what we called men and women's language, right? That was way back in the 80s where we saw differences in power dynamic and how people communicated in terms of gender. And that's changed significantly um, over the years. And, but my interest was always in in language. So what happened is as my father was dying on those last weeks, um, I noticed really remarkable changes in his language. And being trained to pick up a pencil and paper whenever I heard fascinating language, I just began to write down what I heard. And there were many levels to the changes I heard. One was just was very dramatic in that my father was a hardcore skeptic and rationalist. And suddenly he started pointing to angels in the corners of the roof, you know, the corners of the ceiling, I mean, and started talking about seeing angels. So something like that was just really dramatic. And then, of course, there were many other changes I saw. And because of those changes, I went on to to try to discover more about people's final words. And so what what involved or what was involved or is involved with the the final words project itself in terms of your collection of data? And how'd you go about all that? Well, um, when I first became curious about people's final words after my father passed on, I went to Berkeley where I studied linguistics to the library there. And I thought I was going to find an abundance of information about end of life communication, because what I saw before me in terms of shifts in metaphors and certain types of structures that I'd never seen before, I thought, oh my God, I'm sure this has been studied. Before. So I went to the library just to, to look at and start reading articles, and there was nothing there. And I was stunned because, as a linguist, there's, there's so much written in terms of people in the beginning of life, right? For uh, toddlers and infants and language acquisition. But, but there was nothing in terms of end of life, you know, what happens at end of life. So I just began to read everything I could about end of life. And of course, I rediscovered Raymond, Li- Raymond Moody's book, Life After Life, that I read when I was 17 with open eyes and very 
it was very compelling to me. And so I reread that book and synchronistically, a friend of my mother's was teaching a class with Raymond in Alabama. And she said, why don't you go and just meet the guy? And another synchronicity, three days later, I got $2,000 tax return. <laughs> and uh, so with those synchronicities, I just um, went off to Alabama and I met Raymond Moody. And on the fourth day of that workshop, he started talking about his lifelong research into nonsensical language, like the language that we hear from Lewis Carroll and that kind of paradoxical and nonsensical language that you also hear at the end of life. So when he started speaking about that, I, I was, again, in awe. And afterwards, he told me he had been looking for a linguist for many years to work with him on studying final word. And I thought, oh, my goodness, this is a, a natural pairing and a great synchronicity. And I left my home in California. I left my job and my lovely, uh, my all our children were grown and sort of gave us permission <laughs> to head out to Georgia. And, um, and then I mentored with Raymond Moody and we um, started the Final Words Project, which is really an informal research project. We're not associated with the university. And what we've done is we've just um, had lots of conversations with people. We've had people who have volunteered to transcribe their loved one's final words. We've done, uh, the internet, as you know, is remarkable. I, we've been able to get submissions to the website. So that's, and I've interviewed experts in the field and heard, you know, heard their stories and accounts. And I found this interesting too, reading your, reading your book, that Raymond Moody was the one who coined the term near-death experience. Is that correct? Exactly, exactly. So you're, you're pouring over all of these accounts of, of people recording the, the final words of, of loved ones and, and things of that nature. What is the thing that you found most in common across all of these different accounts that you were getting from people? Mm, that's a great question. Um, well, the thing that I saw most in common is that there seems to be a progression, and I call it a continuum of, of language, away from literal language, you know, just here is the table, right, to more metaphorical, people start speaking these remarkable metaphors, to the next level of um, nonsensical and paradoxical language, like the whispering silence, you know, things like that that are paradoxical. And then we see, to me, I think hints of almost telepathic communication, first nonverbal and then kind of telepathic, where people, a lot of loved ones are able to sort of be in tune with, with the person who is dying in ways, in deeper ways they may have never been able to before. So I see this kind of continuum moving away from literal language. And I also saw, it seemed to me, it was tracking kind of a transpersonal continuum also. It seemed people started talking about visitors in the room with them. You know, they started speaking of unseen worlds. And as I mentioned earlier, paradoxical speed. Um, so that was maybe the main, the main thread was that continuum of language that moved towards sort of nonverbal language to the last, to the last breath. Well, I found it interesting, too, as you mentioned with your, your father, that he was a, a staunch materialist, you know, not someone that would be, because I could p imagine someone that is talking about the angels all around us, then seeing angels before death. But for people that who, who do not fit into that mold of, I believe that I'm going to see a, an elephant headed God when I die or angels in the sky, to start to have these visions that, that leads to, or it piques my interest as to, wow, there, there's got to be something else going on here. And you, you do get into a little bit of the science of, of the brain and stuff in your book, but you focus on the, the language side of things. I'm curious, linguistically, what is the most fascinating thing that you noticed? I and mean, we can talk about, well, we're, we're seeing these big patterns, but is there anything that is kind of narrowed down to, to just in that realm of, of linguistics that really shocked you with what you saw? Um, well, there are two things. One is something that I'm calling sustained narratives. And you'll see someone maybe two or three weeks before they're dying and they're beginning to move into um, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes in kind of almost like an altered state. And they'll start talking maybe about the train. And the train is having, there's wreckage on the train, but we're trying to move north, right? So that's three weeks before dying. Then, I, then maybe five days later, yes, the train keeps going on the tracks and now there's the man waving at me. And then, uh, you know, as the 
death approaches, there's still this narrative about the train going on. Now, if I were to ask you about something you started talking about three weeks ago, could you tell me? Could you? Could you I can't me? even remember yesterday or any of the conversations, let alone three weeks. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, to me, that was just to see a narrative sustained over time like that was remarkable. The other thing I thought was really interesting um, is something I'm called non-referential speech. So you hear people suddenly saying things like, it's not what you think. So we don't know what the it's is, right? Or my father said to me, this is very interesting, Alice. I've never done this before. Or um, Roger Ebert, who is a well-known film critic who passed away, his, uh, he wrote to his wife right before he died, this is all an elaborate hoax. Right. So you hear, we don't know what people are referring to. So when my father said, this is very interesting, I was wondering, what is this, this? And you hear it, um, you know, someone might come out of a coma and turn to their loved one and say, it's not what you think. So what is this, it's, right? So that's interesting. And how about one more? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love it. Called a hybrid sentence, where what you find is people begin to speak in these hybrid sentences that are one foot in this world and one foot in another world. So someone might say, can you get the ladders from outside because I have to climb up there? Or bring me my checkbook I have to pay at the gate. Or um, what was another one? Bring me my pencil. I need to write down the names of all the guests coming to the big party. And then the names of everyone on the list are deceit, right? And oftentimes references to the big party is a metaphor for dying. And people refer to these like large occasions that are coming. So those are some of the things to me in terms of linguistic, um, hybrid sentences, non-referential speech, sustained narratives, increase in metaphor increase in repetition, all these things I looked at and thought, wow, this is, this is different than what we see in ordinary healthy speech, and it's compelling to me. One of the things that I'm super interested in personally is metaphor, because I'm, I'm such a lover of myth and, and religion and theology and, and how metaphor is used. And, and I, could, I could see that and expect that in, in these moments, perhaps. I'm curious if there is anything based on all the, the research that you went over and all these different final words, as it were, for people are dying, that if there was something that you didn't find that was actually quite surprising to you. Oh, what a great, great question. That is a wonderful question. You know, what I didn't find as much of, I saw some of it, people definitely make final requests and seek reconciliation. I didn't see quite as many, as much, I didn't see people reflecting on their lives as much as I expected. You know, I think in my romantic idea before final words, I thought people might say, oh, I remember when I was a boy, you know, or I, I remember Joseph when you and I talked about, but I think what's happening is our brains are changing so much that doesn't happen. Now, I'm not saying it never happens, but it happen, doesn't happen the way I'd expected. I kind of expected these more kind of romantic, retrospective, reflective discussions of the past. And, and you don't really find that people seem to be engaged in a very interesting new reality as they're dying. And and they still say words of love and reconciliation. There's no doubt about it. Um, but that would be one of the things I think surprised me the most. Now, perhaps this falls into that and you, you didn't see much of it, but I'm, I'm curious if people were were giving advice to loved ones on their deathbed and, and if there was a common thread that you noticed between certain types of advice that people would give often to their loved ones in these final moments. Uh, probably may not be surprising, but love is really important. Like, um, you know, please make sure uh, to take really good care of so-and-so, you know, and even almost precognitive where people will say, you know, it seems like Sandra has been really sad lately. Please make sure she gets more love or why don't you get Toby some guitar lessons? I know that would really cheer him up. And, and the wisdom oftentimes comes veiled. It, it's not always as direct as you, you would think. For example, one woman told a story about her father-in-law who, um, she wasn't a particularly what we think of as attractive woman. And he used to always kind of make fun of her being chubby and just not looking as beautiful as we think of as beauty. And she was, of course, hurt that her father-in-law felt that way. And then she told the story how just as he was dying, he turned to her and said, you know, I never realized how beautiful you were. I'm so sorry. So, you know, it was indirect in a way, right? And so that's more the kind of, kinds of things that I hear. But you also get something very practical um, in one dramatic instance of terminal lucidity. 
Terminal lucidity is when someone maybe has been unresponsive and then suddenly, very right before people die, there's often this kind of very lucid moment. People actually even are described as glowing. There's like this light around them and oftentimes their speech becomes really, really lucid. And there was this one case of a gentleman whose mother had Alzheimer's for years and, and did not make much sense to him. He really had a hard time communicating, then was in a coma. And a couple of days before she died, she got up, looked at him and said, all the files you need to make sense of everything financially are in the third drawer down in my study. You know, now this is the most one of the most dramatic I've heard, but that's uncanny. Um, but yeah, so that's the kinds kinds of clarity you can hear at the threshold, but but not always. In terms of impact on life. I mean, we, we at least like to think that like, hey, when we're, we're nearing our, our final days, we've, we've got maybe not, maybe it's not figured out, but at least there's a few things that we could kind of sit and say, wow, I, I learned this in life. I'm curious at, at what you've learned from this experience of hearing about what everybody else has learned from their life. Like what is the, the distilled thing that you've really gotten from this work that, that's teaching you personally in your life on informing different ways to live or, or things that really that are important at the end of, of the journey, as it were? Well, one is um, I was someone who was afraid of dying, like many of us are, and you know, to the point I didn't like to go on airplanes. <laughs> you know, I was really scared of flying. And one of the biggest things that's happened through the Final Words Project is I have no fear of flying anymore. <laughs> and it's really clear to me that there is something that exists beyond the threshold. You hear people have conversations with deceased loved ones with such clarity and such ease and comfort, and a large percentage of people. I mean, we're talking, you know. 70%, and this has been corroborated by other research that's been done. Um, so I really have lost the fear of dying. And I also feel that by writing down my father's words, I entered into the portal with him. And I feel like my life has been very much more spiritual and sacred in the years after his death, because I feel like by writing down his words and really being with him in a really profound way um, in, his, in his final days, I've I've entered into, into an altered and sacred state. And I do feel like the portal is a sacred place, just like it is when people give birth. And, and you know, you know, you, you're, you mentioned you're a new father that, you know, birth is not beautifulness. I mean, it's beautiful, but it's not what we think of as clean and easy, right? It's hard. It's, and it's hard and, and it can be messy and full of pain. And I think dying has that similar quality. And yet the, the portal is open and something sacred is going on. And that I did not feel that way about death and dying five years ago at all. I mean, I had no perspective of it being a sacred portal. And I never thought that I would fly in an airplane and, and be totally at ease with what happens, you know. And, and you know, one last what last story is uh, came from a Christian minister who's who shared that um, he had a 21 year old congregant who had a two brain tumor, and just as he was dying, um, he was having this conversation with an unseen, which often happens. And he goes, "I know, I know. We agreed on 22 years this time. I know." And the you know minister had indicated, "You know, this is against my own religion. This is not part of it, but this is so compelling to me. I had to it had to be shared, right?" So that's compelling, right? That's compelling to me that something's going on. You mentioned spirituality. Has there, I mean, you mentioned that the, you, you recognized a, a sacredness around this, this portal of, of death, of transitioning into another state of being. Are there, are there other things? The, the, the plain thing to me sounds very much like it's a, it's a practical in your life thing that shifted. Are there things not so much about death, but about life in spirituality that you learned through this this work? Um, I think I learned to really try, you know, I felt really called to do this work. I mean, I gave up a great job. I left California and moved to Georgia, which I, you know, it was crazy. I gave up everything. And I've never in my life followed a calling so profoundly. And um, my savings are gone. <laughs> I mean, frankly, you know, I, and, and yet, it was such, well, meeting Raymond Moody and meeting the people I have that have been involved in, in near-death studies and everyone involved in hospice work, um, it may, you know, one of the things that people say often when they have near-death experiences, they come back, they'll say, I never felt as alive as when I was dead. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. when they have these afterlife experiences, now not everyone again, but, you know, a large percentage of people. And, you know, in a strange way, I've never felt as alive as I have 
in doing this work. Um, and so that's how it's impacted on me. And I've also felt much closer to, um, I, I feel like I hear spirit in a way I did not hear spirit because once you start listening to the words of the threshold, it's really hard not to believe that there is a language of the soul or that there's some kind of alchemical language. You know, you think about koans or chanting and the nature of that language is very different than the language of our ordinary days. And so there really is a uh, altering quality to, to this language that I've spent so much time studying now. Um, so the impact has been extraordinary. And I'm very, very, very grateful to my father and all the ancestors for inviting me into this because it's been, it's yes, it's been remarkable. It's changed my life. And, you know, I'm going back to Georgia. I never thought I'd be a Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought I'd be living in Georgia and working with Raymond Moody. So what an incredible blessing those things are. What advice would you give to someone who, who is or, or who does have someone in their life currently in their, their final stage, as it were, who, who's currently on that journey towards death now? What, what advice could you give them in terms of interacting with or learning from or just simply being with what obviously not only your own personal experience and feelings of this, but from, from all the work and all everything that you've gathered, what, what advice could you give that person? Um, well, you know, when we hear language that's different than the language we're used to, especially from someone we love, uh, like a mother or father or a partner, you know, our first response is to freak out and be afraid. And, and my invitation is imagine that that language is sacred. You know, think about what sacred language is, right? The, how funny chanting or koans may be, right? But, but imagine that the language of the threshold is sacred and enter into it. For me, it helped to write the words down as a way to enter in. Some people don't like to do that and that, you know, but whatever ways you can enter in, validate, validate, validate the reality of the love of your loved one. Someone just sent me an email today about her, her partner who passed on, who kept saying, mama train, mama train, mama train as she was passing. And, you know, generally people are like, what the hell is wrong with her? What's going on? And instead she said, let's get you ready to go on that mama train. We're going to go see your mama. And she sat her up in bed and people lovingly held her. And they're all like, chuka, 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 chuka. we're heading on that mama train. We're going to go see mama. Right. And, and rather than walk away in fear and terror, it became almost a ritual and a ceremony. And suddenly she was very agitated and and the, her beloved just became very, very relaxed and, and died soon after. So I think if we can think of that language as ceremonial and ritual, it, it can shift how we hear it. You're, you're talking about sacred language and, and metaphors and, and all of these sorts of things in terms of, of course, you're a linguist. So this is the, the power of words. But you're also saying there's nonsensical language. How do we, and I mean this sort of culturally, globally, uh, well, well, let's leave it culturally United States, because the United States, we seem to be very afraid of death. We put dying people away so we can't see them. It's not on display. People don't like to talk about it. How do we start to convey? Because your, your book, you give a lot of examples. You give a lot of stories. And I think obviously story might might or is one way of doing this. But how do we decode or, or translate these messages that, you know, get on the mama train to practical living advice to people in the world today? I mean, you're, you're also a poet. So is, is poetry that avenue or, is all, or all the arts that, that, that meaning to convey those things that are kind of nonsensical, but then configuring it in a way that really touches our, our heart as humans in the moment today while we're still living? Like, what, how, do, how do we bridge that gap or translate that, that language to everyone living in the world now who, who doesn't have somebody right in front of them dying right now or may not. You know, I grew up, I, I had a few, uh, obviously, grandparents deceased. I never had someone very, very close to me die. So it, it's death seems at times as a far away thing unless I'm coming into it. So to hear about this stuff to me is like, wow, well, what what's there to learn? What's What what don't I know about? How do we start translating this stuff for, for everyday people? That's a great question. Thank you for that. You know, it seems from what I've learned that we have nonverbal consciousness and verbal consciousness, right? And nonsensical language can allow us to enter into state that are different than sensical language. So, I mean, just I'm sort of repeating myself here, but the whole thing of, you know, what's the sound of one hand clapping, right? Which is the traditional koan and, and, and it's not sensical, right? Or something my father said, my modality is broken, 
like, what the hell is he talking about? But somehow it makes sense, right? I think in our own lives to realize that there, there are states of being that we can enter and we can explore through language. And, you know, think about something like being in love, you know, try to try to describe that the same way you would describe a chair. It's almost impossible. And so we have to resort to metaphor. Anita Morjani, who had a near-death experience and wrote about it in her book, said that her experience of dying and coming back was so ineffable that only metaphor could describe what happened. And, you know, I love living in the realm of symbol and poetry. That's why I'm a poet, obviously. But I think our lives become richer. And if we look for synchronicities and symbols around us, they speak to us, you know, and the more we look for them, the more we see them and the more they inform us. So I really believe living in the realm of the symbol. And I know one one final thing about that is when I interviewed psychics, the majority of psychics that I interviewed for this book have a spiritual Icon- iconography. It's symbolic. They'll see certain symbols. You know, if I see a rose, someone told me it always means this. Another really brilliant psychic told me that the images she trusts are only the nonsensical images because she knows it's not her left brain intruding. So we know that the more nonsensical, or what we think of as nonsensical imagery, many times is more connected to what I think of as the field of consciousness, the field, because it's beyond our analytical kind of the analyzer. So I I think there's kind of this beauty and this nonsensical nonsensical reality. And again, the language of people have had near-death experiences is paradoxical always. You know, I never felt so alive as when I was dead. And, or, you know, I've never... So if you think that that kind of reality is accessible to us here, and if we can live in the realm of symbols and synchronicity and magic, where things don't just mean one thing, you know, <laughs> then I think life is much more interesting. So when you find a feather on the street, it's not just a feather. It might be a million different other things too. Oh, I, I, I love hearing you say that because it, it so much follows a, a very deeply held belief of mine. I, I was so influenced by Joseph Campbell growing up, uh, still am to this day. He inspired an absolute fascination and love for symbols and metaphor. And as you said, it, it draws a richness out of life. One of the, the shamans that I spent years working with, he was always like, if you're, if you're looking outside every day and all of this stuff is there, but you'll notice for a week in a row, every time you look up, you're going to see a coconut. And the coconut's always there, but for one week, you just keep looking at it every time you step out your door, or there's a blackbird, or this or that, and you find out what those things mean, and you recognize that the universe is actually talking to you. In the terms of nonsensical stuff, you know, having led uh, shamanic drum circles and things like that for years, and experienced them from other people, and different, different whether drums, rattles, this sort of thing, the, the most common experience was people going in thinking, my power animal is this. And so they go down there, they, we, we enter in the journey like, I'm expecting, I was the same, I'm like, I'm, mine's a monkey, it has to be a monkey. And of course it was not a monkey. And it, it almost never, ever is the thing that the, the left brain thinks that it is. So people come out and it's usually the really quiet one as we're going around and sharing circle and they don't say anything and they're finally like, all right, look, I'll share. But, you know, I, I was a I was a, a, a butterfly and I'm not a butterfly. OK, like if anything, I'm a bear and not a butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> something to that effect and then they'll they'll look up what that symbol is and they're like oh my gosh this this defines me to a t or it'll be something random like a gecko and they're like i don't even know what a gecko like i've seen a gecko but then they read it and they're like this this is me this is this is the energy and it's it's talking to something in the subconscious i mean i've heard i don't know what the actual figures are because i've heard so many people say different things in terms of how much of our our waking consciousness is governed by the the, the conscious mind versus the subconscious mind like how much of our actions are governed by that, whether it's 90% or 80%, I don't know. But there, there's this magically rich well in that. And whether that's just our subconscious or the collective consciousness, uh, I think it was Jung who said that, or, or God or the divine, there's something that gets tapped into. And it sounds like from, from reading your work and, and listening to you speak that people at that time of death are tapping into that in ways that, you know, we're not doing it without meditative practices or, or prayer or, you know, smelling salts or like or whatever the, the crazy stuff someone might do to, to get out of their their brain. And that that's fascinating. And I think that's the magic of it. And that's the magic that's been with me for the last five years. And, you know, to, to dare to live in this, because there's a kind of chaos and paradox, right? And to surrender to it totally can be scary, but also 
incredibly amazing. And that's what death is, just like birth. I mean, we're surrendering to something that is much bigger than us. And there's deep, deep beauty in it. And, and it's sometimes a little scary, too, to be part of it. Is that the, the big message that you've gotten this for, for life in terms of just what, um, what, what, what to take from life? Mm, that's a really good question. I think today it is, you know, before our radio conversation, I was just sitting outside and kind of you know, checking in, meditating. And, and I think for myself personally, um, I do, I love to dance. I told you I, I love to do ecstatic. I love to dance. And that's always one opportunity to just fall into the chaos and give myself permission. But I think partly too is allowing myself to do that in all areas of my life, right? And, and because when you, the nonsensical realm or what we call nonsensical is just so much more multidimensional. And it has that cross-dimensional quality we're talking about. But it's also scary because we live in a world where, you know, you know, if I break out and dance and start chanting all sorts of strange things at the bank, <laughs> I may not make it to the teller. So I don't know, you know, and it's, it's just about, I think it's a balance in our life. And I think the, the amazing thing is the dying are teaching us that that might be the ultimate language, you know, really. Or the, and, um, but definitely surrender is the ultimate language, right? Mm. I mean, obviously, because that's our last, our last action. And our first. I will say that in my community, if you start chanting and dancing in line at the bank, they won't bat an eye. Some of them might even start dancing with me because I, I can guarantee that I've done something to that effect in my bank and they're cool with it. So don't, don't worry. There are other people out there that, that, that won't find that so nonsensical. They're like, yeah, all right. It's, it's Wednesday. Woo, dance. Um, where, can, where can people find out more about you? You've got your, your website, The Final Words Project, your book. What's, what's the best way to connect to you and your work? in your writing? Probably the best way is through the Final Words Project. They can find out more about my book. They can find out a lot of information just, you know, free on the website. And also, um, people are welcome to just email me at uh, finalwordsproject at gmail.com. I love to have conversations with people. And also, we're still collecting accounts that people have of final words. And um, they're, they're, they're very meaningful to us. So anyone, and no matter how nonsensical or strange or how boring... <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, mundane, they seem, whatever they are, they're really um, important to our continuing research. And that's finalwordsproject.org, correct? Not, okay. And we'll, we'll have that in the, in the description and, and notes and all that as well. Um, so for people listening, yes, you can not only go read her book and find the information, but if you have this information to share, she is still collecting it. So you can add to this wonderful collection of work that, that Lisa has created over the years. Any final words for, for people listening? <laughs> Any not. Um, you know, I just realized because we we're both in California, I will be at Napa County Library March 30th uh, talking about final words and doing a presentation and East West Books in Mountain View on April 25th. So it's all on my website, but it'd be great to see some California folks. So, yeah, thank you. That was a pleasure. Thank you. I, I definitely enjoyed it. I'm sure people have learned something new today. I hope all of our listeners have a very present moment. And thank you so much for listening. Namaste. Hey, everybody, it's Ashton here with an announcement. We're starting a weekly contest giveaway over at Savannah Spirit. If you'd like to enter into the contest, to win one of our weekly prizes, go to savannahspirit.com slash contest. If you enjoyed listening to the podcast today, we'd really appreciate it if you went over to iTunes, left us a review, leave us some comments, and share this podcast with anyone who you think might enjoy it. Also want to invite you to go check out Savannah East, which is the name of our blog and also the name of a Facebook group where I interact with guests and our audience. We'll post recent episodes up there as well as interesting articles relating to our guests and or the topics on the shows. And again, thank you so much for listening. Namaste. You've been listening to the Savannah Podcast. To find out more about Savannah, go to savannahspirit.com or follow Savannah on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Savannah Spirit. For daily inspiration, check out our blog at savannaheast.com. Be sure to join us next week for a new episode. And thank you for listening to the Savannah Podcast. <laughs>